Polly has a word for the feeling you have when you see with someone else who's happy, and you're happy along with them. It's mudita. Translated as appreciation, empathetic joy. It's one of the four Brahma Viharas. And of the four, it's the one that's discussed the least. But it's as important as the other three. It's what goodwill feels when it encounters someone who's actually happy or who's creating the causes for happiness. Then it's the opposite of resentment, jealousy. And it's an important quality to develop. And we see other people creating the causes for happiness and we feel happy with them, it's easier for us to create the cause of happiness as well. Because we're always just into joy. Like today we had the Songkran festival. The Songkran itself is not a Buddhist holiday. It actually comes from a astrological belief, which is that the new year begins when the sun enters the constellation of Aries. Of course, the new year could begin at any time. There's no one point as the earth goes around the sun where it passes a little spot that goes click, moves us up to the next year. We could have January 1st, we got the Chinese New Year, there are all kinds of New Year's. But it's a good convention to have, because it reminds us that our years are numbered. We just want to think about our lives. What are we doing with our lives? The one thing it's important to do with our lives is to create the causes for happiness. So even though Sankran is not a Buddhist holiday, they, they observe it in a Buddhist way. Like today we had the, the Papa, which was a group donation. And the atmosphere is very festive. And for a long time, Western observers thought this was very ironic. You know, they read the Buddhist text in such a way as to see it as very pessimistic. They interpreted the First Noble Truth as, life is suffering. They interpreted nirvana as total annihilation, that somehow that the only way out of suffering was to annihilate yourself. And yet here Buddhists were having a good time. They thought, these poor Buddhists, they don't understand their own religion. They've distorted what the Buddha had to say. That was what they thought. But if you look at what the Buddha actually had to say, it's a very festive message, a very happy message that true happiness is possible. And it is possible to totally put an end to suffering. And you do it by doing good things. Being generous is something that feels good. Observing the precepts, learning how to avoid harming yourself, avoid harming other people. As you get used to it, there's a sense of self-esteem. That sense of blamelessness that comes. If we sit here and meditate, showing goodwill for ourselves by the way we breathe, showing goodwill for others by trying to train our minds. All these are very good things to do, which means not only is true happiness possible, but it can be attained by doing good things. The general message of the world is that happiness is possible, it has its limitations, but it can be found, but a lot of times you have to do it by clawing other people, scrambling up the ladder, stepping on other people to get ahead of them.
That's the way of the world. Or by holding a belief that you're a part of the chosen few and everybody else has to go to hell. Well, that's too bad for them, but as long as I'm, my skin is safe, that's okay. And that's really a miserable belief when you think about it. All the mental contortions that people have to go through to think that the Creator of the world wanted to sentence his creations to damnation and that he was just and kind in doing so. There's nothing of that in the Buddhist teachings. True happiness comes from developing qualities you can be proud of, and it's something that's available to everybody. No wonder when the Buddha passed away, people celebrated his life. The very first Buddhist festival was the Buddha's funeral. It was conducted with song and dance. People were planning to cremate the Buddha one day after he passed away, but they had so much fun singing and dancing in his honor that they delayed the funeral for another day, and then another day, and another day, and it was finally a week after they'd had enough. And that became the template for Buddhist festivals ever since. And so it's good at the end of the day like this. We've thought about all the people who came and they wanted to be generous. That's why all those people came here. Some people wanted to fix food to hand out to everybody else who came, and other people just came to be generous in other ways. Generous with their time, generous with their, their money, generous with their strength. And it's good to rejoice in their merit. The, the word for rejoicing in other people's good activities, anamodana, comes from the same root that mudita comes. Moda, muti. Other people do good and you appreciate their goodness. Sometimes you're at the monastery, it's easy to feel overwhelmed when this wave of hundreds of people come in. Here we are, very really quietly minding our own business, and all of a sudden this huge crowd comes. It's like this huge wave washed into the monastery and then just washed out. And one of the women who came in today noticed that our regular kitchen crew seemed to be cowering with the onslaught. And it's natural to feel that way. We've been living quietly, and all of a sudden everybody comes in and they're having a big party. But it's also good to think, here are the people coming to make merit, which is not just merit points. They wanted to do something that was good. They wanted to make themselves happy by doing something that was good. And you would look at what so many other people are doing in the world right now, trying to destroy the rule of law. Trying to make their fortune by taking advantage of poor people. Killing other people, all the horrible things that are happening in the world. And here's a group of people who want to get together just to do good in a harmless way. So it's good that we appreciate that. And encourage that in them and in ourselves. Because that sense of encouragement and appreciation is one thing that helps to dissolve the, the boundary we place around ourselves and our cherished ideas about how things should be done. Because the word mudita is related to another word, muhu, which means to be soft, to be gentle. We're malleable, which is a good trait. Not in the sense that we'd be malleable if someone came along and wanted to do, do harm. But when other people want to do good and they find happiness in being generous, that's something you want to encourage. The Buddha talked about that various motivations people might have for being generous. The lowest, he said, is for desiring reward in the future lifetime. But even that has good rewards. 
but higher rewards come simply from enjoying doing what's good. It makes you feel good to be generous. Is that something you want to encourage? Because for all we know, the, the arahants look at our notions of what it means to do good. They might shake their heads. They were not quite there yet. But they still appreciate and encourage and feel empathy for our desire to do what's good. And so it's good to think that there are people out there who take joy in supporting our practice. Of course, that places the onus on us to, to practice well, to make it a kind of practice that's worth other people's support. So no matter how tired we may be at the end of the day, it's good to appreciate the fact that there are people out there who want to do good. There are people out there who find happiness in doing good. And that should make us happy, regardless of whether the support is directed to us or to other people who are practicing. It's good to spread the happiness around, because that's one of the fine things about the Buddhist teachings. It points out that happiness doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. In other words, it doesn't have to be the case that if you gain some happiness, somebody else has to lose, or if they gain, you have to lose. As the Buddha pointed out, there are some good forms of happiness where everybody benefits. In terms of generosity, the person who gives benefits, the person who receives benefits. The same with observing the precepts. The person who observes the precepts benefits, and the person who's not killed, not stolen from, not lied to, doesn't have to deal with people who are getting drunk or engaging in illicit sex. Those people benefit as well. When we meditate and lessen our greed, anger, and delusion, learn how not to be overcome by our moods and emotions, realize that we have tools to use so that the emotion is not just a given that we have to accept, but it's something that we can learn to work with. We can learn how to reshape the present moment in a skillful way inside our minds. We're not the only ones who benefit. The people we touch in our lives, touch with our thoughts, touch with our words, touch with our deeds, they benefit as well. So this is why it's good to rejoice in the, the goodness of other people. It reminds us that the true happiness dissolves barriers like this. True happiness spreads around. And it energizes our own practice to develop that quality of appreciation and empathetic joy. And so in return, we can dedicate the, the merit of our practice to the people who support us. As a passage it appears several places in the canon when the Buddha points out that one of the valid motivations for wanting to become an arahant is that the, the gifts that are given to you will then bear great rewards for the people who gave them. In other words, becoming an arahant is not a selfish thing. You realize that a lot of other people are going to be able to benefit because you've cleansed your mind from greed, anger, and delusion. So when you see other people doing good, even though it may not be the goodness of meditation yet, they do good by being generous, they do good by being virtuous. It should encourage you, though, to 
step up your own practice, to find joy in your practice as well. John Sawat was struck when he first taught Westerners how grim they were as meditators. He said this is because people come to meditation mainly here in the West without having gone through the training in generosity, the training in virtue that Buddhism gives. Partly because the training in generosity and virtue we got here was you know, generosity was forced on you, virtue was forced on you. In the Buddhist teachings, generosity is taught with a sense of freedom. You're not obligated to be generous, but it's a good thing to be generous. And you learn how to do it with a sense of joy. The same with the precepts. Nobody forces you to take on the precepts, but they show you the way action works, the way karma and cause and effect work, and you develop the desire to be virtuous. This is what right effort is all about. It begins with generating desire. This is the right attitude to have towards the difficult parts of the practice. You train yourself to want to do them. So the lesson we can learn from the people who came here today, that you want to learn how to find joy, even in doing hard things. Learning to see them as challenges. You're up for the challenge. You want to figure them out, these things out. It's a skill to master, and there's a joy that comes in mastering a skill. This is why it's good to find happiness in the happiness of others. It's good to find happiness in the activities of others that are genuine causes of happiness. That helps us create those genuine causes in ourselves as well.